everyone and welcome back to my YouTube channel. If you're new here, my name is Danica. I am learning how the internet works through some ASMR. I'm using YouTube. I'm also reading a book right now. Um, today is chapters 8 and 9 of my book, So Be It. Um, I will link in the description below chapters 1 to 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 uh, if you're interested in seeing that. So if you checked into the last video, um, we learned that Heidi had found these pictures from Hilltop Home. Um, she talked to Bernie about going there. It is in Liberty, New York. Bernie, obviously being a reasonable adult, says, hey, maybe you shouldn't go to New York. But Heidi says, I'm going and there's nothing you can do to change her mind. So let's get into chapter eight. Chapter eight is called More. I didn't tell Bernie about my plan. We both had our minds made up in opposite directions about me going to Liberty, and I didn't see any point in discussing it with her anymore. Anyway, she had her fans full with Mama, whose headaches were coming on a daily basis now. I might have told Xander, but he made himself scarce for a while after the incident with Bernie. I called Greyhound from a phone booth outside and found out two important things. One, it would cost me $313 for a round ticket to for a round trip ticket to Liberty. And two, you had to be 15 years old to travel across the country by yourself. As I've mentioned before, I was tall for my age, but the difference between 12 and 15 is pretty noticeable, especially if you're looking for it. Getting the money was the easy part. I wanted a lot playing slot machine in the downtown Reno bus station. Since the machines at Sudsy Duds only took nickels, I figured I should find one that took quarters, so I wouldn't have to deal with quite so much change. I wondered whether my sweet way with slots would extend beyond the realm of the Sudsy Duds, and luckily I found it did. I knew $313 in, th in quarters would be a pretty heavy load, which is why I decided to look for a machine right in the bus station. That way, I wouldn't have to haul the money too far. I took the number five bus there, curlered my own hair as best as I could, and put on some of Bernadette's red lipstick in front of the cracked mirror in the station bathroom. Up close, I wasn't very convincing, but I'd had plenty of practice flying under the radar. It took me a little over a half hour to win the money off a big machine I found near the fast food joint called Tommy Bun's Hot Dog Heaven. I nearly had a heart attack when the coins started chunking down into the bin. They seemed so big and loud compared to the nickels I was used to at the Sudsy Duds. It was early in the morning and nobody was around to pay attention, so I squatted down next to the machine and counted out my winnings. 1,256 quarters, one dollar more than I needed. I had stopped at Bernie's bank on the way and gotten some paper sleeves to put the quarters in, ten dollars worth in each roll. It took me a long time to count and roll them all, but when I was finished, I put the money into a big old canvas duffel bag I'd found in the back of one of the closets. Bernie had made me clean it out the week before. I dragged the bag across the floor a little ways, to a bench near the ticket windows. It was too heavy to drag all the way back over to the bathroom, so I wiped off the lipstick with the back of my hand and unpinned my hair using my fingers to comb out the biggest tangles. Then I sat and waited for the right person to come along and help me buy my ticket. It didn't take long. She was kind of beat up looking with fuzzy dark hair and black eyeliner all the way around her eyes. Her lips were thin and turned down at the corners, in what could have seemed like a mean way, except I had a feeling she was okay underneath. Bernie probably would have found something wrong with her, with what her eyes were saying, but I had to use my own judgment, and she seemed alright to me. She sat down two benches away from me, her legs sticking straight out in front of her, snapping her gum and reading a magazine. I walked over, dragging the bag behind me, and got right to the point. I need somebody to buy me a ticket, I said to her. Running away, are you? She said. Boy, I know what that's all about, kiddo. Do I ever. But I ain't got no money for a ticket out here. Not for you or me neither. I didn't bother to explain to her that I wasn't running away. She probably wouldn't have believed me anyway. I've got the money. I opened the bag and showed her the rolls of quarters. Jeez Louise, what'd you do, rob a piggy bank? She laughed. Her teeth were crooked and the front left one was chipped and gray. So all you need is for me to buy it for you? How come you can't buy it yourself? You've got enough money, right? I nodded. I'm not old enough to ride alone, I explained. How old you gotta be, she asked. Fifteen, I said. You could be thirteen, she said, squinting at my face, but not fifteen. I know. 
When I get on the bus, I'm going to ask somebody to let me pretend I'm with them. That way the driver won't ask me how old I am. She smiled. You got a plan, don't ya? I like that. Girl with a plan. Hey, maybe you got enough to take me along? She asked, arching a plucked eyebrow and eyeball in those rolls of quarters. No, sorry. All the extra I've got is these. You can have them, though. I fished around in my pocket and held out the four extra quarters I'd won. She gave a crooked smile and shook her head. Keep it, kiddo. Where are you looking to get to, anyway? She asked. Liberty. I hear you. Where are you going, really, though? She said. Liberty, I said. It's in New York. Oh, I've never heard of it. So what's in Liberty? She asked. I won't know for sure until I get there, I said. She smiled again. You're pretty deep for somebody so low to the ground, she said. Come on, let's go get you a ticket. She helped me drag the duffel bag to the ticket window. I had been right about her being the right person, because I don't think many people would be willing to stand there being chewed out by the ticket man for buying a ticket with all those quarters. Judy. She told me this was Judy with an I. Didn't even flinch. She just stood there snapping her gum, saying, Hey, money's money, man, and waiting until he finally shoved the ticket through the window at her. Get lost, he said, as she turned away from him and handed me the ticket. Get a life, she replied over her shoulder. I thought about Judy saying that and about how the way she said it made it sound insulting. But later, after I'd thanked her and was standing at the number five bus stop with my ticket to Liberty and the four extra quarters in my pocket, I found myself saying, I found myself saying it softly under my breath. Get a life, Heidi. Get a life. And there was something about the sound of it that I liked a lot. I also like that idea. I like that it's kind of an insult and Heidi was like, oh my gosh, get a life. Like, I'm still trying to get a life. <laughs> Chapter nine is called Back Soon. Even if Bernadette hadn't had AP, she wouldn't have been able to come with me on my trip. There's no way we could have brought Mama along, being the way she was about buses, and who else could have possibly taken care of her while we were away. I would have had to go alone no matter what. I didn't tell Bernie the morning I went down to the bus station to play the slots and get my ticket. She thought I'd gone to the Liberty, or she thought I'd gone to the library. It was the first time I'd ever lied to her. I didn't like the way lying made me feel. So I was anxious to set it straight as soon as I got home. When I told her what I'd done and showed her the ticket, she was livid. I've poured my whole self into you, Heidi, she said, like warm milk into a bucket. Why are you doing this now? Why can't you just let things be? Because things aren't the way they're supposed to be, I said. How are they supposed to be, she asked. A person is just supposed to know where they came from, Bernie. We've been over this already, she said. It doesn't matter where you came from. It only matters that you're here. Maybe that's what matters to you, but I'm not like you, Bernie. I don't want to be like you, and I don't want to be like Mama either. Are you trying to hurt me? Is that what this is all about? She asked. It has nothing to do with you, Bernie. It's about me. Don't you get it? I shouted. You think I'll forget about Suf and Hilltop and all the rest of it. You want me to forget, but I won't. And if I do, I'll end up like Mama, full of missing pieces. The pieces you're missing are not the important ones, Heidi, Bernie said. Don't tell me what's important, I yelled. You don't know. You don't know anything. You want me to be like you, but if you really cared about me, you'd want me to be normal, I said. Bernie turned her face away sharply as if she'd been slapped. I feel as though I don't even know you anymore, she said, and burst into tears. I cried then too, partly because I felt bad about hurting her feelings, but mostly because I realized what she just said was true. She didn't really know me anymore. I wasn't sure I knew myself. I wanted to go to Liberty. I needed to go, but I was also afraid, and I couldn't admit my fear to Bernie. She would have pounced on it like a cat on a yarn ball, unwinding my resolve. It's not safe, Heidi, she said. You're too young to go by yourself. I didn't tell her that it also wasn't legal. Why should I fuel her fire when I knew she'd find out soon enough anyways? I have to go alone. You can't come with me and neither can Mama. There isn't any other choice, I said. Yes, there is. Don't go. Bernadette was begging now. Wait until you're older. Listen to me. I'm not saying forget about it. I'm saying give it time. We can keep calling Hilltop. We can keep showing your mama the photographs. Maybe she'll remember something. You're just saying that to try and keep me here. You know mama can't remember things, Bernie, I said. I don't care what you say. I'm going. You may not go to Liberty, and that is final, Heidi, Bernie said one more time. You're not my mother, I shouted. You can't tell me what to do. You're not even family. You're nobody. Nobody. 
Bernie snatched the ticket out of my hand. She was so angry. She didn't even look like herself anymore. Is this what you want, Heidi? She hissed, her hand shaking as she held the ticket up in front of me. Is this all that matters to you anymore? Yes, I said. She looked at me hard and long. Fine, then go. Just go, she said. She threw the ticket on the floor and stomped across the kitchen and through the doorway into her apartment, slamming the door behind her. It's the only time I ever remember seeing that door closed. Bernie and I didn't speak to each other for the rest of that day. I kept going into the kitchen to check, but the door stays closed. And for some reason, I couldn't bring myself to open it. Mama asked for debt several times, but I was able to distract her and keep her occupied with a Flintstones coloring book and endless cups of tea. At dinner time, Bernie finally came over and heated up a can of stew. She spooned it onto plates for Mama and me, but then she took her own plate back to her place. This time, she left the door ajar. I put Mama to bed alone for the first time in my life. Luckily, she didn't give me a hard time. I even got her to shower and wash her hair, which was usually Bernie's department. Later, I took my bath, and when I was lying in bed, Bernie came in and sat on the very edge of the bed. You mustn't lie to me ever again, Heidi, she said. I had to, Bernie. Otherwise, you would have tried to stop me from getting the ticket, I said, raising up one elbow and squinting at her in the dark. I saw her smile, a sad smile, and shake her head a little. We both know I can't stop you, don't we, Heidi Ho? Three days later, on the afternoon of September 22nd, I left for Liberty. I had tracked down Xander earlier in the day to say goodbye and to tell him that I'd managed to convince Mrs. C that he would make a good replacement babysitter for me. He was happy about getting the job, but mostly he wanted me to tell him again and again exactly what I told him to Mrs. C. I told her you were a good person, I said, and a good friend. For real, you said I was a good person? Swear on your mother's spit, he said each time. Swear on my mother's spit, I promised. Cool, he beamed. Will you check in on Bernie and Mama, I asked him. Take out the trash and bring up the mail? Yeah, you're coming back though, right, he said. I nodded and was a little surprised by by how sad I felt having to say goodbye to him. Mama was in bed that day with one of her headaches. Bernie had already given her four Tylenols, but she was still moaning and holding her head. Goodbye, Mama, I said, as I leaned over to kiss her cheek. Back soon, Heidi, Mama said, looking up at me. Yes, Mama, back soon. The trip itself would take three and a half days in each direction, but that wouldn't make any difference to Mama. She had no sense of time passing at all. I could have just as easily been going downstairs to check the mail that day. I stood at her bedside with Bernie's old beat-up PF blue suitcase in my one hand, my backpack containing my list book and two ham and cheese sandwiches slung over my shoulder, and the ticket to Liberty carefully tucked to my jacket pocket. Back soon, Heidi? Mama asked again, lifting her head off the pillow and smiling weakly at me. Yes, Mama, I replied, but the truth was I would not be back at all, but not as the same person I was that day anyway. Bernie and I had made up after our big fight. She told me that she forgave me for the angry things I said, and even though I promised not to lie to her again, there was something changed between us, and I carried the weight of knowing that I had hurt her. It was impossible for her to hide her fear about my trip, but she knew my mind was weighed up, was made up, and she didn't fight me anymore. Not even when she found out about the age limit. I'll manage it, I told her, even though I wasn't sure how I would. Bernie even helped me pack. Sometimes it almost felt as though we were on the same side. But then she'd say something that made it clear again how totally against the whole thing she was. This is all Thurman Hale's fault, she said bitterly right before I left Reno. If he had just been willing to talk to us on the phone, you wouldn't have been leaving now to chase down that good-for-nothing four-letter word. Her face went sad and she looked like she was about to cry. This is for you, Bernie, I said quickly, pulling a small cardboard tube out of my backpack and handing to her. What's this, she asked, wiping her eyes with the back of her hand. She opened one end of the tube and slid out the tiny, the shiny rolled up paper inside. It was a map I had bought for her. I'd use a highlighter to mark the bus route from Lirino to Liberty. There was another part of the gift, a plastic box of colored pushpins. The map is to be put on the wall by the phone, Bernie. I'll call you at each stop and you can use the pushpins to mark how far I've gone. You'll know exactly where I am that way, just like you always have. Bernie hugged me. I have something for you too, she said. She handed me a small box tied around with red yarn. Open this when you get on the bus, she said. We hugged again. Mama came out of her room, still in her nightgown. Her hair tangled and matted with sweat. 
I could tell from the way she was squinting that her head was still hurting. Kiss, Mama said, coming over and putting her arms around both of us, pressing her way into Bernie's and my embrace. I turned and pressed my cheek against her soft, smooth face. Mama felt my tears. Uh oh, Heidi, she said. I love you, Mama, I said, and I kissed her. Mama pulled away. Tea, Heidi, she said, looking at me expectedly. No, Mama, no tea now. Oh, Dad, she said, holding her head. I know, precious. I'll tuck you back in when Heidi goes. And you can have more jello, Bernie told her. Then she turned to me. You'll call from every stop? Yes, from every stop, I promise. And I want you to call me the second you get to liberty, Bernie said, burning her hands on my shoulders, the way she always did when she wanted to make sure I was listening to her. I will, I promise, I told her. You've got your sandwiches and the money I gave you? Yes, I said. You remember the name of the cab company? Yes, Bernie, ABC. She had called Liberty Information and located a cab service right near the bus stop that could take me to Hilltop home. She tried to let them know at Hilltop that I was coming, but the woman who answered the phone there kept putting on her on hold before Bernie could get the information out. You'll call me when you get to Liberty and then again when you reach Hilltop. Yes, Bernie, I told her again. I promise. Don't tell anyone that you're traveling alone. You pretend to be with someone at all times. Someone who looks safe. A woman. Someone who could be your mother. We'd been over all these details countless times. Once you're at Hilltop, you get whatever answers there are to be gotten, Heidi, then climb back right on the bus and come back home. I will, I said. She was still holding me by the shoulders, and when I tried to pull away, she slid her hands down my arms and took both and took both my hands in hers. I have to go now, Bernie, I said. Reluctantly, Bernadette let go of my hands, and her arms fell heavily to her sides. Don't be afraid, she whispered. I'm not. I lied, even though I promised never to do that to her again. Heidi, Bernie's voice got thick, and her eyes filled up again. Don't worry, Bernie. I'll be fine. You're going now, she said. It wasn't a question, but a statement of fact. When I got downstairs, I stood on the stoop and looked up. Bernadette and Mama were both standing at the window. Xander was sitting on the steps eating devil dogs. He handed me two unopened packs. For the road, he said. I wanted to hug him, but I wasn't sure how he'd feel about that. So instead, I punched him in the arm. He grinned and punched me back, but not too hard. See ya, he said. I walked backward, my suitcase bumping against my leg. The box from Bernie tucked under my arm, waving to Mama and Bernie and Xander until I had to turn the corner. As I waited for the number five, I set my suitcase and the box down on the curb. I was really doing this. I was going to New York by myself. I felt a strange hollow sensation in the pit of my stomach and my mouth tasted funny, metallic like the water from the drinking fountain at the library. I swallowed hard and looked up at the clear blue sky. It was comforting to know that a piece of that very same sky would be hanging over Liberty when I finally got there. Bernadette had been right. I was going to Liberty to chase down a four-letter word. S-O-O-F. Whew! That is the end of chapter nine. What an exciting couple of chapters. I'm really surprised that Bernie wouldn't be a little more excited for Heidi considering that she knows how Heidi feels about wanting to be herself and wanting to know where she's from and who are the people that made her who she is. So I'm a little surprised at that, but I am excited that Bernie came around and I'm really excited to see how Heidi gets to Liberty, if she ends up able talking to Thurman Hill and what other shenanigans she gets into. I'm excited to see who she meets too. So if you are interested in all of that, be sure to subscribe, leave a comment and leave a like as it really does make a difference. And I will see you in the next video, likely on Tuesday with uh, some more chapters. Thanks so much for paying attention and I'll see you at the next one. Bye.